we'll never get rid of the State of the Union because only once a year does the President of the United States get to speak to 48, 50 million people unfiltered by the media. Good morning, Mark Thiessen, your uh, resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, previously chief speechwriter to George W. Bush. That's, that's correct. 43, chief yeah. speechwriter to Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense. Yes. And of course, well-known flack for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in the happier days of yore. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we're here to talk about the now delayed, but finally happening State of the Union. Yes. Let me ask you one really, really procedural question. Sure. How does the State of the Union get written? <laughs> it is a, uh, it's a long process. It is both the worst speech a president gives and the most watched speech a president gives, um, which is why they all give it. Mitch Daniels had a column the other day saying uh, we should get rid of the State of the Union. We'll never get rid of the State of the Union because never, only once a year does the President of the United States get to speak to 48, 50 million people unfiltered by the, by, by the media uh, directly to the American people, which is why Donald Trump is giving this speech and why every president who has a chance will do it. Um, it's a really hard speech to write because uh, I worked on, I was the lead writer on two of them in 2007 and 2008. Ironically, the last time Nancy Pelosi uh, became speaker. Uh, so I've, I've been in this, uh, in this situation before. Um, it is incredibly hard to write because it is essentially a laundry list of policies. Uh, because everybody in the federal government wants to get their policy named and their policy mentioned. And so you're under tons of pressure from every branch of government, every office, everybody's trying to cram in their policy. And yet you have to have a theme to it. And it has to, have, it has to be a speech that people are going to pay attention to because no one wants to listen to a laundry list of policies. Um, so you start out usually after Thanksgiving. Uh, the president will, will the speechers will give the president an outline of what they want to say, what the issues are. Uh, then you start drafting uh, over Christmas, and he probably takes a first look at it in the beginning of January. Uh, you usually we with President Bush, we'd start having sessions in the Oval Office where you'd go over drafts, you'd edit them, he'd give you edits, send them back. I have to interrupt then... you. I just have this weird, strange, sneaking feeling that that's not how it's, how it's happening, happening in now. the Trump White House. <laughs> It's entirely possible that it's very different um, today. I'm just, I am just—I only know what I've lived through. I can't, I can't speak to what the, what's going on in this White House. Uh, there's a, a vigorous fact-checking process in the, in the Bush White House, which I suspect is Again. not happening exactly in the same way today. Um, and then what happens is that there's a family theater in the residence, which is a movie theater. And what they do is they set up a teleprompter in there at a podium. And the president goes and he starts practicing the speech in front of, in front of a small group of people. Uh, he'll deliver it once. The first one starts as an editing session. Well, he'll start editing. And by the end, he's just owning it and delivering it and preparing for, for delivery. I suspect that's happening. Um, I and hope then, so. And then, <laughs> and, uh, and, then you, uh, and then he goes and delivers it in the, in the rostrum of the House of Representatives. And it's, uh, it, is un it is really one of the most effective speeches a president gives, despite the fact that it's a, po a list of policy initiatives. Um, because people are paying, once a year, everybody stops and pays attention to the president and listens to him and gives him a chance to make a case for what he what he wants to, the direction he wants to take the country. I, uh, I, I think I it's a, a good feeling, institution. Right. Have. I have a feeling that once every three minutes we stop and pay attention to what Donald Trump is doing. <laughs> and and moreover, yeah. I feel like Donald Trump likes it that way. So that's that's sort of a difference. Sure. Um, one more procedural question. I yeah. think it was Ronald Reagan who began what I now view as this almost execrable <laughs> process of calling out people in the audience. Yeah. Um, who's sitting next to the first lady? Who's sitting next to the you yeah. know? Who's sitting next to important people up on up in the rafters? And uh, and using Lenny them Skutnik. as right, Lenny Skutnik. Nobody, yeah. nobody will remember who no, Lenny, Lenny Skutnik, Skutnik was. was. The guy who jumped into the Potomac when the plane when a, uh, I can't remember what what flight it was, but a plane hit the Fort Air Street Florida. Bridge. Air Florida flight hit the hit the 14th Street Bridge, and he jumped in and saved a bunch of people. And so President Reagan put him up in the uh, in the in the in the guest box and referred to him during the speech. And ever since, every president has has done the same with somebody. But to to the point of, of ridiculousness, and they really now don't feel genuine. They feel like props. They feel Sometimes, like uh, yeah. people who are being used to further a particular agenda, grind a particular axe. And by the way, that's a total bipartisan slam. Yeah. That's, that's Democrats, Republicans, it that's depends. everybody. It depends. So we, there were every year uh, when we were doing work in the State of the Union in the Bush administration, we'd sit down and we'd say, for, we'd do two things. One, we'd say, we're not going to do a laundry list of policies. We're going to do a thematic speech this time. And it never happens. <laughs> and then two, and then two uh, 
we would try to not have the people in the box mentioned in the speech and see if it and it never works It always the president always wants it because uh, it's such again the reason why the president gives the speech is because it's effective the reason the president uses be, uh, human stories in the box is because it's effective people like that stuff and it's, um, but it's and also retail politics it is and uh, but I thought actually that Donald Trump did it better than almost any president had in his last State of the Union address because usually what happens is you have a, sp a speech and then at the very end the president says, and in the box today, we recognized Lenny Skutnik or, you know, yeah. you know, whoever the heck it is, or Martha Stewart we had once up there, for God's sake. Oh. <laughs> it was just like, you know, it was like was ridiculous. Snoop, was Snoop Dogg he, with her or and, was he? No, no not this, well, no, that just not this isn't time. He couldn't all. get in because of the, uh, because the, <laughs> the drug arrest. Um, but, <laughs> but, uh, and so, but what Trump did is he, he, instead, he weaved them through his entire speech yeah. uh, and used them as, as, as he was going and making a point and then he would point to somebody in a box and tell their stories and I thought it was incredibly effective. Okay, so, so yes. Now, now to predictions. Yes. What uh what he will do be... or what he should do. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> we could discuss both. Well, yeah, well that, the two very different conversations yes. and of course we don't know what he will do because we're not privy to those discussions anymore at the White House, but what do you think the theme is going to be? I have a good guess. Well, obviously, this is coming in the midst of this, the, the government just ended government shutdown and the battle over the border. Uh, so clearly, that's going to be a central theme uh, of his speech. Um, I, I think that I, I wrote a column the other day so it was suggesting so what the president ought to do. I mean, right now, the president is in a, has just lost the shutdown fight. So he is in a weakened place where he has lost his leverage in the battle over border security. Um, the Democrats have all, are not going to give him a wall. They're just not. Um, Nancy, even though they even though they gave the previous president a wall five years ago. So Lamar six Alexander, years ago, I guess. Lamar Alexander pointed out the other day that the last four presidents, two Democrats, two Republicans, collectively uh, collectively built 654 miles of wall along our 2,000 mile border, uh, and Democrats voted for all of it. So there's no substantive reason not to give him a border wall. It's the only reason they don't want to do it is because one, because Trump wants it, right, and two. And because their goal is not to secure the borders, to destroy Donald Trump, and two, because he, because of the shutdown, he put he made it a manhood issue, where right. it was all, and so there's really no, even if they wanted to be reasonable, which is which I don't think they do, they don't really have a place to go to be reasonable because he he made it such an issue that if they now give him a wall after all of this. Uh, then their base will crucify them. Nancy Pelosi is a hero now for standing down Donald Trump. If she turns around and gives him a wall, uh, her base will crucify her. How, how do we? So, how do we? Okay, so. Donald Trump's big aim here will be not the sort of majestic, historic, you know, 200 plus years of American history and presidents giving the State of the Union, although they used to send it up in writing. Yeah. Um, it will be, how do I stick it to Nancy, that, that dame behind me right there who's pulling faces I at me? I don't think he'll do, I think he will, t I think he will, t look, the last two State of the, Donald Trump has trouble with presidential, right? Yes. But. In the State of the Union, both of the addresses, one is a State of the Union, one was an address to Congress because it was his first year in office, but it's the same basic forum. They've both been very presidential and very and very elevated and very well delivered. He he can do, this is the tragedy of the Trump presidency, he can do presidential. Right, he just, he just chooses not to on a regular basis. Well, he but, can't control himself. Or can't enough. control yeah. himself, but he's capable of doing presidential. Um, and he's done it twice with the State of the Union. So I would expect the State of the Union is going to be elevated and presidential. Um, but it's going to be, but he needs a strategy for how to get back on top when it comes to this border fight. I think that while he doesn't have leverage on on the border wall, he does have leverage on border security because the Democrats have been at pains to say, we're not, we're, we're just against the wall. We're not against border security. We want a virtual wall. We want sensors. We want this. We want that. So what I, if I was Trump, what I would do is I would go to the Department of Homeland Security and say, okay, you... Department of Homeland Security, the professionals, requested 230 miles of, of border wall. The Democrats have said no. If you can't have that, how much more money do you need to secure the border through all those means that they say they support? And then get, you know, how many more border agents do you need? How many more immigration judges? How many more censors? How many more towers? And then go and say to the Democrats, okay, you said no border wall. It's going to cost, it costs a lot more to secure the border with people and technology than it does with steel slats. So here's the bill. I'm not negotiating. This is it. You pay this. This is how much the security professionals say it costs. It might be $10 billion. It might be $20 billion, whatever the number is, and say, here it is. You said you support this. Pay for it. And then he wins because then he can say, 
I've done, I've done more to secure the border than any president in American history. And by the way, he doesn't have to give up on the wall. He can still say, we still need a wall. I'm going to still fight for it. I'm going to attach a wall to any health care bill you pass, any, any other spending bill, any of your other priorities. But he can get, he could win a massive amount of border security funding. Uh, but they just won't give him a wall. The whole thing is intensely depressing. It is. It, it really because is. Because it's not about substance, it's about politics. It, it's it's so not even stupid. about politics, it's about personal, petty politics. Because in fact, the Democrats, like the Republicans, actually do. Most Democrats, I'm not talking about yeah. their, I'm not talking about their, their, their loons. Yeah. Um, just like I'm not talking about the Republicans' loons. Yeah. Um, you know, most people want a, a country with secure borders because that is actually what yeah. defines a, a, a country. Yeah. Um, for my part, uh, the thing that has been intensely depressing to me is has been to see the corruption of asylum seekers. You know, there are so many people who need Genuinely to be in America, need who yeah. need us so badly, who are fleeing not economic privation, but genuine terror, you know, whether it's you know political oppression or it's actual terrorists mm -hmm. or it's or it's or it's predatory governments, you know, these are the people who really need asylum and our yeah. asylum laws are being abused. And as a result, the quality of this, the the the, the reality of, of asylum requests is going to go by the wayside. Yeah. And there's going to be a harsh attitude on the part of many towards even asylum seekers because mm -hmm. they're going to all be lumped together. Yeah. That's just heartbreaking sure. for, for what we stand for and what we ought to be offering uh, the needy of the world. Yeah. So, you know, our, our Ronald Reagan said it best, I think, in his farewell address uh, to the nation where he said I, he talked about the shining city. He said, I always told you about a shining city on a hill, but I never really described the city to you. And he said it was a city teeming with commerce and people from all over the world. And he said if it had to have walls, it had a wall, but it had a big wide gate that was welcoming to anybody who wanted to come, who had the, who had the dream and, and the will to get here. Um, and I think that's the conservative view of immigration. We have to have walls because we have to have a country, we have to have a system by which we choose people, but we should have a wide gate through which lots right. of people can come. And it seems like er, the, er, the, the Democrats want the, wi the wide gate with no wall, and a lot of people on the right want just the wall and no gate, and we, that's not, neither and of those are the American tradition. Right, and people have forgotten what it is that we stand for and what it is that we ought to be, what exactly. to be uh, about in the world. And there's no, there's no real leadership on these but issues. But to his credit, so when Trump did his address to the nation, the day, the, right before he gave the address to the nation, he held a... The one the, that he gave the, right at the, right when he caved on the shutdown. Right before he caved on the right. shutdown. He, he held a, the first ever uh, naturalization ceremony yes. in the Oval Office, and he said, he, he, he uh, one person was from Iraq, one person was from Bolivia. It was from people I from love all that. different. I that. love that. And I wish. Was, and he was I wish sending it didn't a signal. Feel like a stunt, though. I know, but it was sending a signal that at least that we're for legal immigration. Yeah. Uh, as a party, still, even Donald Trump is for legal immigration, and so we have to get control of our border. I think he's got a legitimate point on the border, and we, and we should all be for border security, but we should have, be a welcoming country as There's well. There's a great speech in there that he could give. All right, let's talk yeah. a little bit about the economy. So last week, the Fed uh, decided to uh, to keep rates steady, which yeah. was interesting because, of course, they had previously yeah. suggested that rates were going to keep going up a few times. Yeah. And Donald Trump behaved, again, not quite getting that presidential thing, uh, <laughs> abusively towards, yeah. the, towards the chairman of the Fed. Yeah. Um, but in fact, I think that the economic situation has changed. The economy has slowed. The economy in Europe has slowed. We're mm -hmm. looking even at a potential downturn at some point. How much is Donald Trump going to talk about the economy, about jobs, about opportunity? And how much is he going to talk about, and this is where I really want to go because we're not really mm -hmm. domestic policy people here, um, <laughs> how much is he going to talk about China? Um, I think that he actually has a very good message to sell on the economy and a good record to present right. to the American people. So one of the things that um, is, is that Donald, what all of us in Washington, both the left and right, he saw something that we didn't, which was that there was a segment of the American population that felt that neither party was listening to them anymore, right. that neither party was taking care of concer their concerns. And I'm a free trader, um, but there were people who were being hurt by trade. And what you always hear about free trade is, well, there's no net effect on jobs, that we, there's maybe even net gains on jobs. Well, if you're on the manufacturing side of the net, that doesn't work out to you so well when the, when the gob gained is a high-tech job, which right. requires an education. So there's a segment of the American population, the people he called the forgotten Americans, uh, who were not being listened to. And they've decided to send a bull into the China shop named Donald Trump. And he 
to his credit, he can come and claim that he's delivered for those people. Uh, the, the manufacturing jobs are growing at the fastest pace in four decades. Uh, the, uh, we have the lowest unemployment rate for people without a high school education, with just a high school education in the history of our country. And that goes and, for African Americans as well, And right? African Americans and Hispanics right. um, and, and, uh, and women uh, are doing better. Uh, he he said it got it gets very little got very little attention, but he went to an African American church in Detroit during the campaign, and he said, "I'm going to fight for you, whether you vote for me or not." And he included in that in his in his tax bill opportunity zones, which is go, a policy that goes back to Jack Kemp. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, creating opportunity zones to create investment. African American employees, the employment rate is the lowest it's ever been. He could go up in the State of the Union and say to the uh, to African Americans, "I told you, what the hell have you got to lose?" And guess what? I've delivered for you, and I know most of you didn't vote for me, but I'm going to keep fighting for you. He could say that. I don't know if he will. It would be great but, if he did. But so he, so he has delivered for the very people who he, who he said uh, he was going to deliver for in terms of how the economy is growing. In terms of China, uh, the, the, the fact is that he's, those people, you know, the farmers and all the rest of it who are worried about a trade war with China, um, they still think that he's doing it because he's fighting for them. And what Trump is, what I think Trump has figured out, is that I mean everybody, everybody thought it was stupid to have a trade war with Canada, right? Everybody thought it was stupid to have a trade war with the EU, but nobody thinks. I don't think there's a person on the left or right who doesn't think that China is an economic predator who is fleecing this country. They're stealing our intellectual property. They're keeping us out of markets uh, through through nationalist economic policies. And and basically, Trump calculated, you can't stop that by going to the WTO. The only way you can do that is by threatening real sanctions mano and, and real, mano. real tariffs. And he, he keeps saying, I'm fine either way, because I think tariffs are great. He's wrong about that. But <laughs> for the fact, if the Chinese think that he thinks tariffs are great and he's actually willing to pull the trigger, they might have to capitulate. Right. So, so I mean, this is the challenge. And our scholars have written really well on this. Dan Blumenthal, yeah. Derek yeah. Scissors. Oriana Mastro, um, Zach Cooper, all of them have written on these issues with China. The problem, I think, uh, is one that's actually being remedied, although people aren't paying close attention. The problem started when the president came in and said, um, all I care about are trade imbalances and our yeah. trade deficit. You know, dude, that's not how economics works. Yeah. I'm really sorry. Even I, an economic ignoramus, yeah. know that. Um, but he has moved away from that and begun to focus on exactly what it is sure. that the Chinese are doing. Yeah. The way that they're using the rules of the international road yes. to exploit the system for their own benefit and to the detriment of everybody else. Yeah. And again, we know there are winners and losers, and there are a lot of winners from our trade with China. Yes. But the Chinese have stolen you know, everything yeah. from the F-35 to your security clearance data, and yours. my security <laughs> clearance data, <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, and, and tens of thousands of others. So yeah. you know, this is behavior that should not stand. And yeah. I think for the first time, we have a, a government, uh, ironically, one of the, one of the most, um, most retrograde leaders uh, of the People's Republic, but yes. in Xi Jinping, who gets it. Yeah. Donald Trump is speaking yeah. his language. Exactly. And so, you know, all we can do is hope that this yeah. is managed appropriately. Yeah. And and that's that's the big challenge, but it does it does shake markets. Yeah. There's it no does. question. Well, so Trump's policy is I mean just you know everyone wonders why is our politics so volatile? You know our politics is volatile, and so is our economic policy volatile because Trump is playing high risk. He's playing a game of chicken with China, and the reality is the only way he wins that game is if Xi Jinping believes he's really willing. He's not going to swerve. He's really willing to uh, to uh, to drive through, and and they're going to have to turn first. Yeah. Uh, I think that also he has an advantage in in that. Uh, the U.S. economy is, despite I think there's going to be a negative impact because of the shutdown in the first quarter. But when I talk to Strain and other people, Michael Strain, our, our economic scholars here, they seem to think that that's going to then boost growth in the second quarter because all that that economic pent product up. will be pushed up, will pent up and be pushed out. So we have a booming, strong economy right now, at least for the moment. China's economy is not booming. Right. Uh, China's economic growth has slowed to a, a minuscule six and a half percent, which is <laughs> which, pro which we'd love to not have. Even that. We'd love to have that. Right. But, Derek, Derek had a very good yeah. piece t telling us exactly how it was we should yeah. measure this and suggesting yeah. that, in fact, it's not even that. It might even be contracting, yeah. some people say. So there, he's in real economic pain and economic trouble. 
which is why, by the way, he just gave a big speech on Taiwan, <laughs> because mm -hmm. whenever you're in trouble at home you and getting criticized, yes. she, we, you know, go go threaten war with Chi with with, uh, Taiwan. with Taiwan and stoke the nationalist fears to get the people behind exactly. you. But so he's his econ he's in a weak economic hand. Donald Trump has a strong economic hand, and he's calculating that China can't afford a trade war while we can, and we can ride one out. And so that's his bet. I don't know if it's true, uh, but again, the forgotten Americans, they say he's fighting for us. Right. He's willing to go to the mat and face down Xi Jinping and fight for us. Okay, and let's so, talk about Russia. Yeah. Is he going to bring it up? The, the Mueller probe? Is he going to bring up the Mueller probe? Is he going to bring up Russia? Is he going to bring up Putin? Fascinating question. So, you know, on Russia, again, like Donald Trump's rhetoric is like horrible on Russia. I mean, the, literally... Cringe the first, the cringe. The, the the first president to defend the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan was I mean, that not a, it was, it was the, the most staggering of of all the staggering things Donald Trump has said and done in years. That was the, the I never thought I could be sh shocked. That was that was shocking, but but his Russia policy is really really good. Right, right. <laughs> you know, no, pulling know. out of the INF, uh, INF treaty uh, sanctions. Uh, I mean, uh, he's, he's you know the, the, he is he's actually following. And people say, well, the Trump administration's policy is good, but Trump isn't. No, he's the president. Yeah, he, you don't get you don't doing, get to play that game. You don't get to play that game. I agree. So a lot of people don't understand is, about you, the INF. But treaty. is he smart enough? to actually make that case in the State of the Union address and lay out, we've been tough with Russia. Here's what we've done, boom, boom, boom. Well, sorry, start, explain the INF treaty for, quickly. So the Intermediate Forces Nuclear Treaty is a treaty that Ronald Reagan signed with, 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 this, with the Soviet Union, which limits shorter range, uh, medium range missiles in Europe and, and their medium range missiles, and the, the Russians have been violating it. And so, and so Trump has uh, said that we're gonna pull out of it, um, and the Russians are really upset about it. Uh, and and the, something everybody's been ignoring is that NATO came out with a statement right after we announced yeah. it and said, yep, yep they Russians are. have been cheating. Yeah, <laughs> but this is also, it's not just a Russia play, it's a North Korea play. Right. Because, you know, it, pulling out of the INF treaty means we could deploy uh, intermediate range nuclear forces in East Asia, which is something that the, is a, is a, if the negotiations don't go well with North Korea, that's something they probably don't want. Okay. So, so, there's, a, so there's some... I'd hate to say this phrase with Don in, in Donald Trump, but there's three-dimensional chess going on here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, then. Um, we'll we'll, like, let, we'll let our audience make a judgment about that one. It's like in Star Wars with the, with the, with the little uh, monsters yeah. and everything like that, and then jumping up from stage to stage. Uh, yeah. I feel like it's more like space balls, but maybe that's just me. <laughs> um, okay, so Russia. So yeah. I, I don't think he can help himself. I think if he's got a line in there about Russia and what Russia's doing and anything that's serious about Russia, he's going to stop and he's going to talk about Mueller. He can't help himself. But he's never talked about Mueller in the State of the Union. You think address. he won't? I think, I think, I think it's just, I, I think that's probably a debate they had in the, in the, in the Oval Office. Right. And I think he, he would be smart to take your advice and not do it. <laughs> it would be smart to take my advice. It would be a first. So let me turn the tables on you and ask yeah. questions. I'm taking over this, I'm taking over this interview. That's right, go All ahead. Right. What 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 do you think he will say about Syria and how it's so the, the the Syria withdrawal I mean literally is universally with the exception of a handful of people Rand here and Paul, there Rand Paul you know, said, is, yeah. is is condemned by I mean everybody in his administration opposed it his Secretary of State his National Security Advisor his Defense Secretary nobody in the administration supports it he hasn't nominated a Defense Secretary because he probably can't find one who will go up to Capitol Hill and defend it oh he can't God. ignore it how does he handle this in the State of the Union address uh, you know this is one of those things where when you talk about the prep for the State of the Union, I just think about the argument that's got to go on there because, of course, that's exactly right. What happened? Donald Trump, after a telephone call with the proto dictator of <laughs> Turkey, the godfather of the Muslim Brotherhood, right, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, he gets off the phone and says, We're out, we're done, we've won, yay! And everybody is gobsmacked. Um, yeah. And you know, what's happened is that is that everybody's tried to finesse Trump, and I think. You know, again, people don't talk about the the the, the president as a rocket scientist, but he, he's he's not a dummy, and he knows when he's being finessed, and he knows when he's being hustled, mm -hmm. and so it's been very interesting to watch as Secretary Pompeo and National Security Advisor Bolton have both been in the Middle East trying to figure out how we're going to manage with our allies this announced withdrawal that is apparently really happening. And I think none of us really know, is it happening? Isn't it happening? Are we switching other troops out? I know that there's a lot of backfilling going mm -hmm. on. The problem is, I think the president thinks this is a talking point. We beat ISIS. Yeah. 
And of course, we the haven't. biggest problem for Donald <laughs> Trump is we haven't yeah. been nice. And you know, this is again, this is this is a, a failure to understand history. This is the great cliche, you know. Um, it is not learning the lessons of history. We watched as Barack Obama pulled troops out of Iraq mm -hmm. and we got ISIS again. And uh, Trump criticized him for it in the Trump campaign. He him called him it. the founder of ISIS and everybody went crazy. How can you call him the founder of can ISIS? Can you imagine if yeah. Barack Obama had made a deal with the Taliban oh my gosh. Yeah. to pull out of Afghanistan? Again, I, I understand and I, I think there's a lot, there's a lot that is um, criticism worthy in our policies, sure. both in Afghanistan and in Syria and frankly throughout the Middle East. And, and we've all written a, a great deal about this. But just because we are not doing it right doesn't mean there isn't a threat. Yeah. And so the problem, why haven't we won in Afghanistan? Great question. I mean, the main reason is because we don't really understand the enemy. We still don't understand the enemy. The enemy understands us. Our yeah. Katie Zimmerman yeah. has written great work on this, and I commend it to everybody who's watching. But, you know, what's going to happen in Syria if we pull out, and we only have 2,000 troops. We are yeah. not talking about Iraq yeah. here. If we pull out the 2,000 troops that we have in Syria, and I think the president is bound and determined to do so, what we're going to see is the reintroduction of Bashar al-Assad to the community of civilized nations. Mm -hmm. Our Arab allies are already talking about reaching out to him, about yeah. reopening their embassies, but he can't control the whole country yeah. because the entire country is against him. What does that mean? It, it inevitably means al-Qaeda marked. 16, you know, ISIS, Mark II, Mark III, yeah. um, Jabhat al-Nusra, you know, this, this Al-Qaeda affiliated and then unaffiliated terrorist group in Syria. It means all of that. It means that we've abandoned the Kurds in yeah. the north. Uh, and that, of course, is why Turkey wants us out. Um, and it will come back and bite us. Amer the American people think that it, it won't bite us hard. And all I can say is it's bitten us very yeah. hard. So Trump, Trump is asking, we've talked about this before, how basically Trump didn't campaign as an isolationist. He campaigned against us sucking, yeah. right? He, campa <laughs> he campaigned against, you know, he wasn't against international. The, the Americans didn't vote against internationalism. They voted against the internationalists. Yeah. You know, they said, you know, Trump said, you and me. we screw, yeah, but also the Obama people. Uh, yeah, people. you, you, you and know, me and you Barack get, Obama. The, the, and the Bush people and screwed up Rose. Iraq and Afghanistan. The, the, uh, the uh, Democrats screwed up uh, Libya and Syria. And, and I'm going to win. We're yeah. going to have so much winning we, you know, at that. And so now he wants to claim victory prematurely. But they, pretending to but, win is not a thing. But, you know, exactly. Remember that mission accomplished banner. Yes, exactly. Don't do that. But, here, but here's the, the, so the Americans ask a fair question, which is, when do these wars end? You know, the, the, you hear the phrase forever war, never yeah. ending no, war, I and know. all the rest of it. And what I always say in response is, generally, if you look at history, wars ended when the enemy surrendered. Right. Right. And so Al Qaeda is not surrendering. The Taliban are not surrendering. ISIS is not surrendering. So, you know, the enemy gets a vote. And when the wars end, we can't choose just because we are tired of fighting doesn't mean the war ends. It just, we, we don't get to choose when the war ends. We get to choose where it gets fought. So but they, what the American people ought to be mad about, and this is what Donald Trump has to think about before his, before his mm -hmm. State of the Union. What the American people are mad about is being lied to about this again sure. and again and again. We told, Legitimately. It, right, mission accomplished, we won, you know, we're going to, I promise to end this war in Iraq, and I've ended this war in Iraq, quote yeah. Barack Obama. Yeah. And, and Donald Trump is about to go and do the same thing, and by the end of his term, Barack Obama found himself in Iraq and in Syria and in Yemen yeah. again, right? That's the problem with Donald Trump is we're either going to find ourselves in those circumstances or we're going to find ourselves looking at some very, very serious terrorist threats, either in Europe, potentially in the United States, to our aircraft and very elsewhere. So. so that's that's the challenge. How does he how does he finesse that? Given that I'm sure in his heart he believes because he wants to mm -hmm. that we won. Well, what he has done, and he deserves credit for, is he has removed the physical caliphate of, of, of ISIS, which right. is a major accomplishment. Great. He, he undid the damage that Barack Obama did by withdrawing and allowing this to, I mean, when, you know, uh, John Brennan testified that when Bush left office, there were about 700 ISIS fighters left. They controlled no territory. And we took their, our boots off of their necks and it became 30,000, 40,000, and right. they controlled a, a territory the size of Great Britain. So now, he has undone that mess by beating them back, 
driving them out of their territory. But our intelligence community, which he doesn't always trust, obviously, as we saw the other day, says that they that they are now stronger than they were in 2006 before the Bush surge that knocked them into that into that. Uh, that, that. I want to take so, you one more place before we stop because yeah. we're we're using up time and also we're cheating because in fact Donald Trump won't talk half as much about foreign policy as you and I are. But <laughs> that's why we control the microphone. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, North Korea, he's got a upcoming meeting. He's going to meet with uh, with the little rocket man again. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got the prep meetings going on right now. The intelligence community is leaking to the New York Times and the Washington Post that the North Koreans are never going to give up their nukes. And um, what's he going to say? It's a fascinating question because, I mean, what he, he's going to take credit for the fact that they've stopped testing. Uh, that they've stopped launching missiles. Uh, he's going to say that we have the best relationship that we've ever had with the North the Koreans. The best. It's beautiful. Because you know, everything's the best. It um, is the best. <laughs> um, and to some extent, he deserves some credit for that. There is a pause uh, in, the, in, the, in all of this. The North Koreans, the, the, I think the intelligence community assessment is right. They're not going to give up their nuclear right. weapons. And this has always been a Hail Mary play. Right. What 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 the president is doing right okay, now? Okay, I hate sports. What is a hail mary play? It's a you, you toss the ball all the way down from the first yard, one yard line to, the, to all the way down the field and try to hope that somebody catches it. Got it. Help uh, you know basically not low, low probability but high reward uh, uh, play. All um, you other not sports people are going to thank me for that. <laughs> I usually use hockey analogies, um, <laughs> I don't but laugh. but anyway. Um, so this was always going to be a an unlikely to succeed but worth trying. Uh, situation. But what do we give up? Well, so this is the so the, again, this is the thing about that I give Donald Trump a great deal of credit. He hasn't given up anything to the North Koreans yet, not yet. except except a summit, which is really not that big a deal. I mean, uh, you know, the the reality is that he hasn't recognized uh, the the North Koreans. He hasn't given diplomatic recognition. He hasn't lifted sanctions. In fact, he's tightened sanctions. Right. On, he just slapped sanctions on Kim's inner circle. Right. So he's actually squeezing, tightening the squeeze. He's put sanctions on Russians who were trading illegally with them. He hasn't ended the Korean War. He hasn't given them a cat. The North Koreans thought that they're going to do their state, you know, package date number two, right. which is we, you know, go. We blow up some towers. You give us billions of dollars. We revive our economy, and we start building again until we and then we play it over and over again. And Trump's basically said, "No, yeah. we're not doing that. So I'm happy to talk with you. Here's what we demand. It's going to be and and the good thing we know is that he's not going to cut a bad deal with North Korea right. because he pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal for a set of specific reasons. And so he, that sets the low bar, the bar that he has to cross in any deal with North Korea. He can't have a, one that's, that has front-loaded sanctions relief. He can't have a deal that doesn't co cover missiles. He can't have a deal because everyone will say, that's what you pulled out of the Iran deal over. Uh, so so, right. he, so he's, he's, he's set a bar. Everyone he, will say is not a strong feature of the Trump administration <laughs> decision-making <laughs> process, I feel like. I think he's also going to talk about Venezuela because things are for once going in the right direction there. Uh, the Venezuelan people are looking at some real relief and they've got, this administration actually has the first semblance of reasonable policies we've seen on Venezuela to relieve not just the Venezuelan people, but the people of South America, the people of Central America, from the danger that Chavismo, Maduro, yeah. and the Cubans who basically run the government yeah. in, in Caracas um, are imposing. We gotta stop because yeah. I know we've gone on too long and we could go on for another hour. If you were writing this speech, it would be fabulous. Um, <laughs> I got my fingers crossed that the president is gonna do a, 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 good, a good job, a creditable job, and that he's gonna make, uh, and that he's gonna make some headway in his, uh, in his no good will come of it fight with Nancy Pelosi. Uh, that Amen. would be that would be the ideal outcome. So thanks a ton. Pleasure. We'll be back next year. <laughs> <laughs> hey everyone, that's the end of our discussion with Mark Thiessen. Thanks for watching and if you enjoyed what you saw, remember to like the video or leave us a comment, a nice comment, and be sure to check out the rest of our videos and research from AEI.